I'm Leo Wooder for Kit Guru, and this is Leo Says, my occasional opinion piece about things in the news. However, I'm going to have to start by clearing up what appears to be some confusion among Kit Guru viewers. The Kit Guru YouTube channel is uh, owned by KitGuru.net, which is a website. It's been running since 2010. I started writing for Kit Guru back in 2014, which seems like a terribly long time ago. But I am not Kit Guru. I am part of Kit Guru. And uh, I'm going to respond here directly to a comment on uh, one of Bryony's recent videos. I'm not related to Bryony and she's not related to me. Neither am I related to Dominic or Ben. Uh, we're all co-workers. Uh, I was really surprised to see that suggestion. Um, also, I, I don't want to get all political or any such. I, I don't have a great time for the whole um, everyday sexism kind of meme. But uh, I've been really surprised by some of the comments on some of Bryony's videos. Now, she recently did a two and a half hour video of building her own PC. Uh, very good video. Uh, and far longer than any video Kitgur has ever done. It's done as almost as an experiment to see how it went down with you. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Well worth a watch. Uh, but uh, some of the comments that pop up on some of our videos are quite unpleasant. They're unnecessarily rude and there seems to be absolutely no uh, place for them. Some of the comments on some of Brian's videos are just extraordinary. Um, we delete them, we, we block them, we occasionally report the uh, people who post those comments. Uh, it is absolutely notable that uh, comments on, say, my videos uh, follow a certain theme. Uh, some of the ones on Bryony's suggest that some of you chaps just do not get out enough, uh, and they have definitely made me reappraise my views to the everyday sexism thing because undeniably it is a thing, and that's just all there is to it. So I've lived and I've learned. And now on with the tech. Uh, in a more general sort of everyday news thing, however, uh, today uh, Professor Stephen Hawking, uh, his death was announced at age of 76. Obviously a famous British scientist. Um, 55 years ago he was diagnosed with motor neurone disease. Uh, we saw him subsequently in Big Bang Theory and The Simpsons. He also went on to win a Nobel Prize, but that's obviously not as important as Big Bang Theory and uh, The Simpsons. This is crystal clear. Uh, achieved a huge amount, staggering went on for so long. I've long wondered whether he was uh, getting medical support from the science fraternity because his, uh, his life went on and on way beyond anything that you'd expect for someone in such a terrible state uh, with such a horrific this disease. So uh, he's gone at a, an advanced age after a, an enormous body of work um, and a loss to us all. That's always uh, a Brit scientist and I doubt what he is like again in my lifetime. Uh, <laughs> business news. We've got, a, we've got a lot of sort of businessy kind of stuff going on. Uh, but then money and tech, I mean, the two things are interlinked. Uh, President Trump, and it still sounds extraordinary to say those words, but President Trump has blocked Broadcom's hostile takeover bid of Qualcomm uh, on the grounds of national security. He did something similar recently with um, steel and aluminium tariffs, uh, which remains to be seen how that's going to work out. Uh, but the idea of national security, Qualcomm, Broadcom, I mean, chips for sure, but uh, Broadcom, it's registered in Singapore and it started life as an American company, a division of an American company, it got spun off. Uh, the idea that Singapore is a strategic threat to the USA, frankly, I struggle to see that. So it's an excuse, that's all there is to it. Uh, so the takeover of Qualcomm has been prevented. But the next logical step to my mind is that Intel will buy Qualcomm. Uh, Intel has got uh, Samsung is of there. They're in a, 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 a severe fight. That's all there is to it. Those two are the biggest chip makers in the world, depending on exactly which chips you're looking at. Uh, clearly, the world of mobile is the future. That's all there is to it. Intel's tried to do its own thing with atom processors and such like without any great success. They're now doing 5G modems, hopefully with more success, hopefully for them with more success. Qualcomm, uh, they want Qualcomm, of that I'm absolutely certain. And now that Broadcom can't uh, open the checkbook to buy uh, Qualcomm, uh, it would seem that Intel, the way is clear. And I cannot see a national security threat from Intel, given as they're also American, unless someone plays up the Israeli angle. Uh, so you would think that the outcome is actually going to be eventually that Intel will buy Qualcomm. Uh, presumably Intel will pay less than they might otherwise have had to pay if there had been a bidding war with Broadcom. And uh, the losers here look to be uh, Qualcomm's shareholders. But uh, that remains to be seen. If this happens, it's not going to happen uh, today, that's for sure. But that's the news in the chip world in terms of... Uh, uh, mergers and takeovers. 
But other chip news, we've got lots of chip news. Now, Hard OCP, a renowned and venerable website, has run a story about NVIDIA GeForce Partner Program, also known as GPP, which is uh, much less of a mouthful. Uh, this, uh, the short take here is that NVIDIA doesn't want its partners who make graphics cards to uh, do stuff with AMD, broadly speaking. Uh, they offer marketing funds and support and such like. They also have tie-ins with game developers. Uh, and obviously, as we know, uh, NVIDIA GPUs at the moment are trampling all over AMD GPUs. Uh, do you want GeForce to 1080 to, uh, Ti or do you want Vega? We know the answer there, don't we? Um, so the GPP program appears to be, the idea is the, uh, that uh, NVIDIA's partners sign up for it. They get loads of support. They're happy. On the other hand, they're supposed to have less to do with AMD. Um, it seems there are some sort of specific clauses and threats, and there are some more implied threats. Uh, the unspoken threat here would appear to be that uh, if you don't sign up for the program, if you don't play nicely in NVIDIA, oh dear, we might not have any GPUs for you at the next launch. And that would obviously be very bad news indeed for any of NVIDIA's partners. Uh, the thing is that uh, immediately the thought that comes to mind here is that uh, Intel has a history of anti-competitive behavior with AMD and they got fined a colossal amount of money, over a billion uh, US dollars for that. And it would seem that uh, there are echoes of this in uh, NVIDIA's behavior or purported behavior with GPP. But it doesn't seem quite like that to me. It seems that, well, obviously NVIDIA are not stupid people. They've looked at what happened with uh, Intel, and, and I presume they quite liked the uh, effect, which, if you recall, for many, many years, you couldn't buy a Dell PC with an AMD processor inside it. Uh, Dell, uh, to name but one company, repeatedly looked at AMD processors and repeatedly, for whatever reason, decided not to use AMD processors. Uh, their partnership with Intel, uh, on the other hand, went from strength to strength, and that's just a historical fact. With NVIDIA, uh, we uh, asked Matthew specifically, our news chap, asked NVIDIA uh, about a part of the GPP program, uh, which reads basically in summary that partner gaming brands must be tied exclusively to GPP. Now, you could read that to mean that ASUS would not be able to brand its Vega graphics cards or whatever AMD comes up with next as Republic of Gamers. Um, NVIDIA put us straight on that one. NVIDIA pointed us uh, to a statement uh, that addresses that particular point. Uh, it, what they said was uh, essentially that you could have, for example, uh, Azus ROG Mars could be for NVIDIA and Azus ROG Ares could be for AMD. So they'd be focusing there on the Mars and the Ares rather than the ROG, in which case you could argue all is, uh, all is fair and all is fine. After all, Azus um, uses ROG for motherboards, uh, which which don't have anything to do with NVIDIA. So it would seem that uh, NVIDIA is being sensible. Uh, they're dancing around the legalities. Uh, uh, you have to assume they'll do that anyway. And they have a particular end in mind. You have to ask why they want to do this, uh, given that they have 70% of the GPU market. NVIDIA is making absolute fortunes out of GPUs for mining, gaming, and artificial intelligence. They're doing brilliantly well. Uh, why would they want to do more brilliantly well? Because that's the sort of company they are. They don't leave money on the table. When your opponent's on the deck, that's the time to put your boot on their throat, and that's all there is to it. So they're leveraging their advantage. Uh, no great surprise, because when all said and done, these tech companies are not angels. Uh, we have actually seen something not similar, but it related. Uh, NVIDIA Gameworks, where they have partnerships with game developers, they go along and say, here's this whole library of stuff that means that you can just plug into our graphics chips and drivers and get good stuff with zero work, and, and they go, brilliant. Uh, we've seen, as a result, that things like Hairworks suddenly makes uh, NVIDIA GPUs look much better than AMD, and things, uh, items on the screen that are behind a hill still get drawn, or items underwater get drawn, all sorts of uh, dubious business and I suppose given its graphics we could call it shady business couldn't we that's a little <laughs> joke um, but uh, on the one hand they're helping themselves and on the other hand they appear to be crippling uh, the performance of AMD until AMD works out what's going on fixes it in the next driver and then we go around again AMD ATI has done much the same thing in the past when they could uh, as I say chip companies tech companies they are not angels this is certainly not an anti-NVIDIA rip but NVIDIA GPP appears to be what it is. So it's all very 10 and 15 years ago. It's history repeating itself in many ways, just a modern spin on it. 
And what we have to hope is that instead of AMD in this instance spinning this story to the press and hard OCP decided to run with it, um, it would be better if uh, AMD was to develop better products, frankly, uh, compete uh, on a more level playing field, give us stuff we want to buy, in which case the uh, partner programs we would tend to ignore, won't we? And they are working towards this. So we have coming up very soon Ryzen 2000. This is the Zen Plus architecture, so it's a die shrink of Zen. Uh, so Ryzen 5, Ryzen 7 uh, should be slightly faster, won't be any cheaper, but we hope to see some performance benefits. Now the launch for Ryzen 2000 appears to be middle of April sometime in April. Uh, so only a few weeks away now, but much information has broken cover. Uh, and most of it looks to be frankly official AMD leaks, but wherever it's come from, uh, I've not yet seen a press deck about this launch. I won't see it till April myself, and yet I can read it online already. And this has happened now, how many times? Many times. Gets a bit vexing if I'm entirely honest. So taking it all at face value, which yeah, bit dubious perhaps, but, the things that strike me are, at the moment, there is no Ryzen 7 2800X listed. There is a Ryzen 7 2700X that goes 300 megahertz faster than the Ryzen 7 1700X. Also, the TDP has been increased. It's uh, 105 watts, apparently. And that's slightly surprising. Now, the 300 megahertz thing strikes me as significant for a couple of reasons. Uh, the one being is that really we want a 10% uh, speed increase uh, over the previous version over the Ryzen, I suppose I have to call them 1000 uh, series now, uh, because you could, you could get those up to about four gigahertz, 10% 400 megahertz, this is 300 megahertz apparently, which is not quite 10%, therefore it's not quite enough, which might explain that increase in TDP. It might be that AMD thought, no, we need a bit more speed. We don't need 200 or 250, we need 300. That means a bit more power and logically a bit more heat. So the 300 megahertz on the face of it, if that is a true figure, is slightly disappointing. If we can get to 400 megahertz increase over the previous generation, that will be acceptable and we'll be happy. Other models, so we've got the Ryzen 7 2700X, also got a Ryzen 7 2700, Ryzen 5 2600X, Ryzen 5 2600. Those are leaked. Uh, we don't know for certain they are correct. The Ryzen 5 2600 is interesting. 65 watt part, 200 megahertz uh, increase in base speed and also in turbo speed. So again, not 10%. But a hand little bonus, and Ryzen 5 1600 will like a great deal. It sounds as though Ryzen 5 2600 will like even more. Also, these are using the AM4 socket. Motherboards are going to be coming to market uh, either now or very soon that have a sticker saying ready for Ryzen 2000. Uh, same socket, they need a BIOS update to support the new processors. So when the new processors come out, common sense says that Ryzen 5 1600 will be discounted and then will then die. And instead you'll buy a Ryzen 5 2600 and the world will move on slightly faster and very happy. This is good, but it is very much an incremental improvement. But uh, these AMD leaks, there are lots of them. We've recently seen uh, leaks of AMD roadmaps going out to 2020, where AMD's moved to these uh, artists' uh, model codes. So for 2018, um, we've so basically we've got three sort of sectors of uh, the chip market that we're particularly interested in. We've got APUs, we've got uh, CPUs, and then we've got the high-end CPUs. So for 2018 with Zen Plus, we've got Raven Ridge. We've already reviewed Raven Ridge with the integrated graphics. Very nice it was too. Not very exciting, but it did a job. We're about to see Pinnacle Ridge, which is those Ryzen uh, 2000 chips. And then we can expect to see Threadripper second gen. I'm looking forward to seeing that, assuming that's much the same thing. So uh, Zen Plus add on something approaching 10% performance, but seemingly more like 5%. But then you see Threadripper uses the, uh, the best chips. So perhaps it will be closer to 10%, in which case I want some of that. Uh, so I'd expect Threadripper second gen, and this is pure guesswork, because it is notable, nothing has been said about this that I've seen, that it will be the same number of cores as the existing Threadripper, so eight, which we ignore, 12 and 16. And then we bump up the speed a bit and we're all happy. You also have to hope that with Zen Plus AMD's fixed memory support, because that's not good. Uh, so if they just kind of do that behind the scenes and that just improves, that we will be happy about. 
2019 gets doubly interesting. So we've got Zen 2. Now, this is the 7 nanometer process. Um, quite how AMD is leaping to 7 nanometer uh, 14, 12, 7. This is a big leap. Intel's still struggling with 10 nanometer, but apparently AMD's got 7 nanometer sorted, they say. You know, kind of on the one hand, can't wait to see it. On the other hand, I believe it and I see it. And wow, you know, the, the, it's just, this seems remarkable. But if they've done it, then brilliant. And the three model codes of interest there are Picasso, Matisse, and uh, Castle Peak. So Picasso and Matisse being the uh, desktop and uh, APU processors, and then Castle Peak Threadripper, which uh, seven uh, seven nanometer Threadripper that sounds absolutely extraordinary. With that, you have to wonder what they're going to do because there's no reason why, if AMD chooses, they can't cram more cores in. After all, they're only using two of the four dies inside Threadripper at the moment. If they want to go more epic, they can. Uh, with a die shrink, they've got even more options. So next year, Threadripper could get truly intriguing. Or, of course, it might just be the same with the smaller process. Um, 2020. Uh, Zen 2 due to be optimized and more artists, Renoir, Vermeer, and uh, what is called Next Generation HEDT Threadripper High End Desktop, taking on presumably Core i9. This is doubly, doubly, doubly intriguing. What's that? 16 times intriguing because the options here are absolutely huge. They can go fast, they can go more cores. Uh, the whole Infinity Fabric uh, modular approach really offers some huge potential. There's no reason why uh, you can't take some of the Uncore off the processor and put that on an extra chip. They could easily have five chips under the uh, heat spreader. We're gonna have to see how that one works out, but that, ooh. and these sockets uh, that are being used here, socket AM4 continues to 2020 and socket TR4 for Threadripper also to 2020. This is impressive stuff. Presumably BIOS updates will be required, but if it really is a case of that motherboard, this uh, processor, off you go, well, wowza. I mean, really good news. Looking forward to seeing that. Intel news. This is just strange. Uh, so Intel launched Coffee Lake early. We know this. And if at any point I say an X370 or a Z370 and I get it the wrong way around, focus on the word Intel or the word AMD because these model codes for these chipsets at the moment are an absolute nightmare. Conversations are just fraught. So Intel is due to launch apparently on the 2nd of April and I've heard nothing from Intel about this yet. Uh, H370, B360 and H310. These are Coffee Lake chipsets. So the uh, Z370 that's already come out, we know was just a revision of Z270. It was rushed. It brings nothing to the party except support for Coffee Lake. That's all it does and not Kaby Lake. Uh, as a chipset, it's very unexciting, dull in actual fact. The new chipsets are interesting in that they include native support for USB 3.1 Gen 2, i.e. what you typically see as a Type-C connector but they do not allow overclocking. Now, Intel's been shutting down overclocking other than on its highest end chipsets for some time. So initially they locked out multipliers, they did that in the processors, and then they've uh, now they've apparently ordained that base clock uh, overclocking will also be not allowed. So these chips are pretty much plug and play. You plug your processor in, you've got a computer, next. And the differentiation between these uh, three chipsets seems to come down to things like how much USB, what kind of USB, uh, how much PCI Express, and also on the lowest end, uh, memory support. Uh, very, very Intel, the whole thing. It does therefore mean that the uh, high-end Intel chipset, the Z370, does not have support for USB 3.1 Gen 2, uh, which means we're waiting for the next Intel chipset. Now, support for USB 3.1 Gen 2, there's a part of me that just wants it on everything. I want to see one or two uh, type C connectors on every motherboard and or front panel. Uh, at the moment, obviously, motherboard manufacturers are using add-in chips, add-in controllers. We know this This uh, just adds expense. The idea it's built into the chipset is, you would think, easier and better uh, as to whether it uh, affects the price of the motherboard or whether it just means that Intel's claiming more of the bill of materials for itself. We don't know. The What I'm not clear about is whether the Type-C connector matters to the greater public because, after all, there are not many devices at the moment that use Type-C. On the other hand, you could argue if you've got a Type-C connector on your PC, you're more inclined to get a device that uses it, you know, you, chicken and egg. Uh, so we'll have to see about that. The 
intriguing thing to me here is that the next Coffee Lake chipset, the true Coffee Lake chipset for enthusiasts, Z390, is apparently not coming until Q3 of this year. You'd have to think that Intel could launch this anytime they want. Uh, as I understand it, it's a Z370 with that USB support added in. Whether there's other features, I simply don't know. And it would seem that Intel has basically held back on Z390 for the time being so the motherboard manufacturers can work through their stocks of Z370. The motherboard manufacturers, after all, were screwed with the uh, stocks of Z270 when Intel just brought out Coffee Lake and, you know, supplies were a nightmare for a few months. And they had this KB Lake uh, motherboard stock in the channel, in their warehouses, and what Z370 Coffee Lake, thank you very much, chaps. It was, you know, just done. You can see the motherboard manufacturers do not want to have the same position all over again. So uh, getting Intel to hold off with Z390 makes perfect sense. Quite nice of Intel to do it, really. That's therefore scheduled for Q3. Whether that's at Computex, immediately after Computex, or heading towards Christmas remains to be seen. But that begs a further question. Intel hasn't yet delivered 10 nanometer. 10 nanometer has been promised for, uh, what is it, a year late? It's just so, so late. Uh, the whole tick tock, tick tock, tock, tick tock, whatever, it's gone out of the window. It's just ceased to be. 10 nanometer was something that we we're expecting. Uh, end of last year originally so any time now would be nice doesn't appear to be coming anytime soon on the other hand uh, added to that intel's also committed to uh producing cpus the lockdown against spectre and meltdown they've given no indication of how many models of cpu or when but during this year so if by the end of this year they produce one processor that's locked down they fulfill their obligations so uh that would be the worst case scenario in a sense, and also the most negligible scenario. Uh, I cannot honestly see it. Well, I cannot see Intel producing, you know, a whole range of processors for Xeons and desktops and mobile and the rest of it are locked down to replace the uh, existing models. That would just be a monumental uh, work. The idea they produce a model or a few models in you know, a very few, uh, very low quantities, that would be plausible. And then as they produce new generations of uh, processors, they'll integrate that support or that security that would make perfect sense I they just cannot replace the existing processors but when are they going to do this if we haven't yet seen 10 nanometer and if coffee lake chipsets are still rolling out into Q3 of this year it seems as though they got to do two or three things at once uh, and they, there doesn't seem any scope for doing this I mean, at the moment, Intel's playing catch up to AMD in many respects, plus the security problems. Uh, they seem to be in a, in a really sticky position. Uh, they've had so many troubles, it would seem, with 10 nanometer, particularly yields on 10 nanometer, that the idea they're also going to change the architecture to lock it down against uh, Spectre Meltdown, I don't see how it can be done. Perhaps I'll be uh, pleasantly surprised. Perhaps they'll produce a wonder chip that is 10 nanometer and secure and does something particularly clever and maybe even has a soldered heat spreader, who knows. But uh, the idea they're going to try and do all those things simultaneously, I just can't see it. And therefore, I can't see them doing it this year, uh, which would suggest Intel's at least a year behind schedule, possibly two. Terrible, terrible times in a way. Um, uh, yes, so AMD seems to be going from strength to strength. Uh, uh, NVIDIA is going from real strength to real strength. Intel, we've almost got to start feeling sorry for them, and we don't do that very often. And then AMD has come under attack. And this is a very curious story. This is breaking news. So uh, a company apparently called CTS Labs of Tel Aviv, uh, backed up by a uh, research paper by some people called Viceroy Research, is telling us that uh, AMD is vulnerable to four different problems, rise and fall, master key, fallout, and uh, Chimera. And this looks really ropey. So uh, these people, CTS Labs, um, they've come out of nowhere. Uh, apparently, the domain for their website is registered 22nd of February 2018. Ownership of the domain is hidden. Uh, they appear to actually be an offshoot of some financial company. And uh, the... Uh, the research people uh, seem to be in the bit of viceroy research. They seem to be in the business of uh, knocking companies so they can make money out of a short position on stocks. And furthermore, viceroy research is anonymous. And when they came up with this paper, and this is the first paper they've come up with on this uh, subject of uh, PC security, 
uh, it wasn't given to AMD in advance so AMD could look through it and work out what they can do and f to fix the problems. It seems to be purely driven by finances. And it has to be said that whilst these security problems might be genuine and might be legitimate, they are so esoteric as to be of no concern to me whatsoever. So they are focusing on some uh, controllers, USB controllers from As Media, uh, ASM 1142, which in turn apparently is based on ASM 1042. Uh, those apparently are the vectors of attack that lay to get into the PC to do all sorts of bad things inside the secure management engine. But it first involves you flashing uh, a BIOS uh, to the PC, which gives you control over it, gets you inside it, and then you can do stuff which basically suggests you've got control of the PC and the, or laptop or whatever in the first place. Uh, so where's the security problem? If you've got control of the computer, you've got control of the computer. This would very much seem like a financial thing where uh, these companies have taken a short position in AMD. They're now saying, ah, oh, AMD is absolutely knackered. Uh, value is zero. They're going to have to go into bankruptcy to get out of this problem, blah, 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 blah. And they're presumably hoping to see the share price tumble. Just as I don't want to seem sympathetic to Intel, I don't want to seem sympathetic to AMD either. This just seems like the most absurd attack I have ever heard of. Uh, it seems entirely confected and the absolute epitome of fake news. The fundamental difference here with this type of fake news and so many other types of fake news which seem more designed to stir up general trouble, this seems very specifically targeted at AMD's financial position so these people can make money. I could be wrong about that, but I cannot on the face of it see any other reading. So. AMD is leaking stories to the press to try and get us to go on about NVIDIA. These people want uh, the world to attack AMD. Intel's are actually remaining fairly quiet, but appears to be having a hard time, although they may end up buying Qualcomm. And Broadcom, who simply wanted to buy Qualcomm with a bunch of money, are not allowed to do so. It's a very strange world in which we live. If you like this video, thumbs up. If you don't, thumbs down. If you want more from KitGuru, click to subscribe. I'm Leo Waldock, and this is Leo Says.